Hey everyone, just wanted to chat with you about insurance companies. I know an exciting topic, but I was just reading through some of my just my research on the new fiduciary rule put out by the, by the Department of Labor. Uh, in my reading on that and looking at uh, you know some companies' uh, quarterly results and their discussions, particularly annuity companies, and discussing how they were going to handle it, I drifted over and just kind of noticed a few quotes that reminded me of an ongoing issue that I've written about before, and that is the uh, stability of insurance companies in a uh, unnaturally low interest rate environment. And let me just give you a little flavor as to what this is and why it affects you. First off, what is the problem? The problem is that with interest rates being low for six or seven years now at zero percent, we just come off a quarter, but you know, whoop de doo, you know, um, we've had seven years now in a row, six years, seven years in a row, where large institutional companies, ones that have to rely on, you know, on on making spread on their financial products, the most obvious being banks. You know, you put your money in the bank at zero and they lend it out in a mortgage at 4%, they make a 4% spread on you. It's not exactly how it works with most lenders these days with Fannie Mae, but that's kind of the simplistic model. Well, there's a whole other group of companies that does the same thing, they're called insurance companies. And insurance, com com insurance companies make their profits uh, in two ways. Um, the smaller way is, is by keeping their expenses low and having you know really good uh, underwriting and claims processes processes where uh, you know if they take in a dollar of premium from you this year uh, they'd be lucky if uh, you know only 95 cents of that went out in expenses you know that'd be lucky for them you know um, <clears throat> so that's one way the other way is through their float through the money that they have in assets that they're earning money on. So, for example, you might have an insurance company that has, you know, ten billion in assets, you know, nine and a half billion in liabilities, and half a billion in equity. Meaning, they're, you know, if you were to sell everything off, they'd, they'd have half a billion dollars is what they'd be worth. <clears throat> so, but that ten billion of equity, even though there's nine and a half billion of liabilities, you know, potential expenses, costs for, you know, that they they, they owe maybe on like annuity contracts or whatever. Um, they can earn money on and that's what they do so for example if they can go out and buy a bond at seven per six or seven percent and at the same time they're selling you an annuity where you're making you know three or three and a half then they make a spread they get three three and a half four percent spread just like the banks they're, they're making spread but here's the problem over the last seven and a half years each year now let's say they bought bonds you know 20 30 years ago long-term bonds those mature and now they have this cash what do they do with the cash in our industry, this is called reinvestment risk. So what do they do with the cash? They have to reinvest it where? If I want a triple A rated bond or a double A rated bond from the government, what am I gonna get? I have to go out 10 plus years to make anywhere near 2%. What about a corporate bond? Well, if I want safety and I wanna buy a bond from Microsoft or from uh, Apple, you know, I mean, these guys don't pay any interest either because they're, they're, you know, the market views them as as good as the government when it comes to paying money back. They have so much cash. So you go further down the credit line, you know, you, you know, and this was infamous a couple of years ago when, uh, you know, when, when junk bonds, you know, the yield on junk bonds dip below 5%. It was like, man, the people wanted yield so much. They're willing to, to take, pay, take so much risk. Like, uh, an asset class that has a, has a historical default rate of, you know, of, of more than twice that every year. Imagine you're gonna earn 5% interest, but there's a good chance you can lose 10% of your principal every year. It doesn't add up. So um, <clears throat> on average, you know, the default rate, you know, at the time had been kind of low, but I mean, on average, it's much higher. So, but none, nonetheless, where, where are they gonna reinvest this money? So if they have to reinvest in something moderately safe, say a triple B rated bond or something, they earn three or 4%. But let's say that's, they were earning five or six, so as you can see, every time that the they reinvest their proceeds from old investments into lower and lower interest rate yields, what does that mean for you who have a long-term annuity or life insurance? Well, it means that the, the, this annuity insurance company is going to be un under increasing pressure to keep margins, and therefore, um, they're going to lower and lower the rates that they can pay on their annuities, which you've seen. You know, if you go get an annuity now, whether it's a fixed index annuity or it's an, uh, just a regular fixed annuity, Either the rates are really low, like you're earning two or three percent, maybe four, um, and with the fixed index annuity, your caps are really, 
really low. You know, you're, you just don't have potential to earn a ton of money. And this has just been a, rea in, in, as a result of the lower interest rate environment. But let me read you something from um, one of the larger um, distributors of, of, of fixed, fixed index annuities, American Equity. Um, you know, no knock against them. They're a decent company, public company. I actually have really have no opinion of them either way, but I was just wanting to get some more flavor on how the DOL rule was affecting in, in annuity companies. And I came across this about them talking about interest rates. We have been counteracting the impact of lower investment yields by reducing the rates on our policy liabilities. But the impact on the cost of money from these reductions is less than the impact on average yield on invested assets from investment purchases. So what they're saying is, is that um, you know, the, their efforts to try to match decreasing interest rates in the market with by decreasing their, um, uh, you know, the, by decreasing their rates on their annuities and stuff like that is is not keeping up. And he further goes on and says, you know, this is the the CEO talking, uh, well, the CFO talking. I, I'll put a link to the uh, to the transcript from their quarterly earnings report on this video or below this video, if, um, you know, if, if you want to go look it up yourself, but. Uh, they said they could further decrease the cost of money by 52 basis points, which is industry lingo for 0.52%, um, through further reductions or renewal rates to guaranteed minimums. That means, for example, um, you have an annuity with some company, and let's say their, their, their current rate is 3%, but the guaranteed minimum is 1. Well, it's looking like they have, they're getting under such stress in the market rate cycle that eventually they're going to have to start bumping people down to the minimum guaranteed rate for people maybe that weren't expecting it. This also further, so, so you need, why this is important to you is you have to realize if you're counting on X percent from your annuity, you need to think, well, maybe I'm not going to get X uh, going forward if this interest rate regime stays the same, if the Fed keeps rates low. I mean, really, this is all architect from the Fed. The Fed is keeping rates low, all right? Um, it's also part of the market, too. There's, there's, such, a, a, there's such an underlying fear. I mean, the equity markets are near all-time highs. I see that in the U.S., um, I don't think they should be, you know, they, I think they should be 10 or 15% lower and they should just stay there until something positive happens, none of this baloney. But that's, it is what it is, you know, I mean, the markets aren't necessarily all fundamental, there's trading aspects, but, um, but there, even though the market's near all-time highs, there's this underlying fear that, that something's going to happen and, and, uh, and also couple that with the rest of the world with negative interest rates in Europe, Japan, and some, you know, uh, Switzerland, I think Sweden, um, so I mean, you know, with 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 excuse that I had to knock something off my screen. Um, you know, with um, you know, with these pressures, you know, so there's so much demand for bonds, pay, even paying two percent, that interest rates from through the market forces and from the Fed are just staying low. So this is potentially dangerous for you for a number of reasons. One, uh, you know, you you may see your annuity rates be lower, as I mentioned. Another risk that you may be facing is premium increases on on other products that the, that the insurance company relies on getting decent investment returns to keep the cost down on. I was recently reading something where they were applauding um, some long-term care companies um, flexible pricing where they're going to, you know, they'll if, if their investments do well, they're going to lower the prices. Well, folks, <laughs> okay, great, nice idea. I don't know if that's going to happen um, if things stay the same way they are. Another thing we have to think about is, you know, life insurance, being able to you know, pay your current rates on savings versus the guaranteed low rate. Um, you know, if you're earning three or four percent in a life insurance policy, the guaranteed minimum is is something lower. I mean, you have to think, well, it might go there. Another thing you have to think about is just the viability of these companies long term. So, what do you do as an action plan? I mean, as a financial planner, as somebody who looks at all this stuff and and you know, and just in in general. Um, I have a bias towards mutual insurance companies due to the fact that they don't have quarterly earnings pressures from their companies to make numbers every quarter. So in other words, a mutual company could, you know, could um, accept lower profits to, in order to make sure everything sm works smoothly as opposed to a public company that you know might get destroyed by the shareholders if they you know, went to the profits first. So you know, a public company has a responsibility to to their employees, to their to their policy owners, and to their shareholders. Right? A mutual company has responsibilities to the employees and the and the, and the policy owners. There's only two groups there, because the policy owners theoretically, technically, however you want to say it, own the mutual insurance company. So 
you have two people that uh, get all the attention, whereas with a public company, you have this third person, the stock owner, that that uh, you know has a vested interest and needs to be you know fiduciarily needs to be you know needs to be taken care of in some way. So I have a bias towards mutual companies. I also um, like to look at the rating agencies. You know, you like to see A rated, AAA, AA rated companies. Um, since so many companies have uh, you know A ratings, at least I'd go for at least double rating, double A rating, unless I have to on on what I'm using. And then lastly, you actually got to go and look at the book of of assets. Uh, you know, my brother uh, used to work in the um, asset accounting field. You know, for big financial institutions, he told me about one insurance company that was that had been has been bought out some years ago, but something like eighty plus percent of their book was junk bonds. You don't want an insurance company where your guarantees, your security, is backed by junk bonds. Do, you, do, we, do are we clear on that? Okay. So uh, this particular company, uh, eighty percent of their book was was like just below investment grade in some way or the other. Just that's not. So you need to look under the hood of your insurance company. So not only to see that that double A rating or that single A rating and say, oh, you know, it's at least an A rated company. You want to look at their um, general account. Where's the money invested? The float. Where is this? And what type of investments? You want a percentage breakdown. And just give you an idea. Now, obviously, you want to see conservative investments, but you have to realize, too, with conservative investments, you're going to have that reinvestment risk. So there's a lot of stuff to face. I think you really do need to analyze your insurance policies that you own, how things are working. And you have to just put some thought into this. It's one of the big risk management things you have to do in this type of risk rate environment. So um, please do that. It's a homework item. It's a to-do list. Whether your advisor does this for you or you're going to do it yourself, Review all your insurance companies, auto, homeowners, um, liabilities, um, uh, um, maybe not necessarily health insurance, but uh, anything with a long-term, uh, you know, obligation to you, uh, including, you know, annuities and life insurance and disability insurance, long-term care insurance, financial strength. You want to look at the general account, what's the financial strength, what's going on with that company, get the annual report. If it's not a public company, you're not going to hear about it in any news, really. So you're going to have to go get the annual report yourself or at least read the one they mail to you. So do that and do a full risk assessment on, on your financial um, portfolio. I'm sorry, your insurance portfolio. And make sure that, uh, uh, you know, from that perspective, but also be ready if you have certain annuities or life insurance or et cetera, long-term care or any other insurance policies where you may either see a rate reduction in your an interest rate reduction on your returns all the way possibly to the guaranteed level if stress stays high or on the other side of it you may see premium increases because the company is a public company and has too many for one reason or also a premium increase because the um, you know they're just they're just getting um, you know the outcomes they're they're the people are just the claims are too high based on the, what they're earning in investments you know if they're only earning two percent on their bonds and the claims are high that year that you know they're they're going to see some issues so for these reasons you really want to know you want to have an expert looking through your insurances to be able to give you good feedback and if you have to change an insurance company i know a lot of people are with insurance companies for a long time you know you inherit your auto insurance from your parents and you're still with the same company congratulations that's great but look at all of them and realize any of them can be changed for the most part, unless you're talking about uh, life, health, or disability and your health has changed. But really, you should analyze all your insurances. If you have any questions, call me uh, and drop a comment below. But uh, I thought I'd share that with you guys, and hopefully that helps, okay?